Welcome to Sipping Success, the ultimate podcast for all things beverage and alcohol. We are here to quench your thirst for insights, analysis, and a splash of entertainment. Get ready to dive into the world of beverages with us. From the latest trends to in-depth discussions with industry leaders, we've got it all covered. Whether you're a connoisseur or a curious sipper, Sipping Success is your go-to guide. Join us as we uncork knowledge, raise a glass to innovation, and help you elevate your brand to new heights. So grab your favorite drink, sit back, and let's sip success together. Tune in to Sipping Success and drink in the wisdom. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Mushroom Media, the go-to digital media agency for all things marketing. From crafting captivating campaigns to decoding social media sorcery, Mushroom Media is here to empower your brand and help you scale. So whether you're brewing, distilling, or concocting the next big thing, Mushroom Media has a solution for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Sipping Success. I'm your host, Casey Hawkinson. And with this coming episode, we're very excited to have Julie Schmalz join us. Uh, she is the founder CEO of Fortune's Fool. And if you're not familiar, Fortune's Fool is inspired by fable and defined by contrast. Fortune's Fool is a drink for the most discerning and adventurous seekers of fine whiskey. From the barrels to the blender to every decision in between, the result is quality. So we're excited to have our conversation here with with Julie, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, and so basically where we'd like to start here is tell us about your history and ultimately what led you to the founding of Fortune's Fool. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist and finished my training in 2004. So when I was in private practice within a couple of years, I realized that this was something I probably didn't want to do until I was 65. And then as the years wore on, it you know, just practicing medicine today really takes a toll on people. And as a lot of people are, are learning. And for a long time, I was looking for a second act, um, something else to do that I could, you know, transition to at some point in my in my career so that I wouldn't work as an anesthesiologist until, you know, full retirement age. And I tried a few things um, that were kind of tangential into medicine and it, it kept getting obstacles in the way. A lot of it was actually starting a business. And I just had hard time like taking that leap to, to make that big, big decision to, to start a new business and to leave um, medicine and uh, when I met my husband, my now husband in 2017, he's a mm -hmm. business person. And so when he knew that I was looking for something else to do, looking for something that would reignite some some passion in me to get up and, you know, jump out of bed every day and want to go to work, uh, we did a brainstorm session and uh, made a list of things that I was passionate about. And whiskey just happens to be one of those things. Mm -hmm. And so as we did some more research, we realized, you know, we're just over an hour and a half away from Louisville, Kentucky, being in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so uh, the resources are all really nearby. And so mm -hmm. um, that's when I started my pursuit of education and, and figuring out if we could do a whiskey brand. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah. You, the geography, you're all just a, a short drive away from various different um, distilleries, big distilleries, and very well-known brands there. Can you, can you, I'm, I'm just, uh, with how we started the show, you used, we had mentioned that your brand is inspired by fable and defined by contrast. So I, I've got some curiosity there. Uh, could you share what this kind of the fable behind Fortune's Fool? So the story behind Fortune's Fool is not only the story of changing careers and um, leaving medicine to pursue, pursue a whiskey business, but it also, uh, my name is Juliet, and so we decided to brand um, Fortune's Fool completely around theater and Romeo and Juliet. Mm. So the name Fortune's Fool comes from a line in the play, Romeo exclaims, oh, I'm Fortune's Fool. 
we thought that was a great name for a whiskey company. Um, it does tend to seem to be resonating with a lot of people. Uh, I think they enjoy that for a lot of reasons. And the contrast has to do with a lot, a lot to do with uh, Romeo and Juliet and where our brand is going, where, you know, there's some masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. uh, in that. And it just, you know, we can keep utilizing that as a kind of a theme for, you know, where we're going with our brand. And is it the both of you and your husband that are like Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet fans, or are you driving that more so? Or can you tell us about that? Actually, I think it was more our marketing company. Uh, okay. You know, Juliet isn't the most common name. Julie's fairly common. Uh, not too many people go by Juliet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, most of my friends know me as Julie. I've kind of reignited calling myself Juliet when I'm in business mode because it does, you know, start to tell the story of, of our brand. Mm. Uh, so I would say, you know, I definitely had to reread Romeo and Juliet because I'm not sure I'd read it since high mm. school um, to get a, a little more of a feel for the story and, and how we're going to tie this into the brand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh we've definitely embraced it and we have a custom bottle coming out that's that has a lot of symbolism and and uh things that are giving a nod to Shakespeare and to Romeo and Juliet in general and to theater in general. That's great. Well, it, we're excited to dive in more then. Um can you we'll kind of shift a little bit and talk kind of more about the business aspect here for a moment. So since you're founding, can you talk to any changes or adaptations you've had to make through the years? Certainly, yeah, tons of them. Um, certainly at the beginning, we had a business plan and I think people in business know this, but people in medicine or other fields, maybe I had to adapt a little more to this than my husband. He kind of was rolling with the punches a little better than me because he's done this before. But we had a business plan and to me that was like, okay, let's go execute. And that's just not not reality so things change, you have to adapt and you have to also know when, what, what things you're willing to compromise on and what things you're not willing to compromise on. For example, we are not willing to compromise on quality. And so that makes some of our decisions easier because if, if any decision has to do with, well, this is, you know, high quality and this is a little bit lesser quality, then we know what decision we're going to make. But our original business plan started with building a distillery here in Indianapolis. And this was in 2018, 2019. We're looking at property. You know, it's difficult. You have to, obviously, you have to get a loan to buy a building and then build a distillery, which is not inexpensive. But then when whiskey is your passion and it's an aged product, then you have to decide, well, how are we going to pay the bank back? until until we have a an aged whiskey product so then it was you know are we going to make gin we're gonna make vodka how are, how are we going to do this mm. and it ended up evolving into well let's do which is what we did um we didn't want to go the all the way to the other end of the spectrum where we're sourcing product and so we went in the middle the middle is uh, we contract this still so i came up with my mash bill. I came up with the yeast strain I wanted to use. I came up with the, the barrels I wanted to utilize. And then I paid someone that has the equipment to make my product for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I even pay rent to have my barrels aged in someone else's rick house, which is very common as well. So yeah. we're technically right now a virtual brand. We don't have a brick and mortar yet. We're working on that. But it's kind of nice because it's a we're kind of doing proof of concept here with like making sure that the kind of product that we're making is going to be appealing to customers and that we can make a, a successful brand out of this. And then we have, you know, phases beyond this where we do build a, a building. Mm -hmm. Will we have to build a distillery? Probably not, but it's, that would be the last step in our, in our progression. Um, but we definitely, we, you know, starting out thinking we would build, then we thought, no, let's just focus on, you know, what we're truly passionate about, which is whiskey. And then came COVID, <laughs> which, you know, nobody was prepared for, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And so then we're dealing with bottle shortages. So we had to 
to pivot with that, um, we ended up releasing our first product and our next product will be released as well in a stock bottle that we had to kind of adapt to our label and brand because our custom bottle isn't ready just due to, you know, the, the changes we had to make due to glass shortages, for example. And mm. there's also been wood shortages. And um, we, as you'll find out, our our big differentiator is our barrel. And we're not willing to put our product in a barrel of lower quality than than where we've mm. been going. And so we have not, we did not produce in 2023 because those barrels were not available. Okay, interesting. And then just so we've got uh, kind of the geography, right? You're located in Indiana. Are you also, is your distiller also in Indiana or is it in the region? Is it kind of been over in Kentucky? Can you talk a little bit about that? Our distiller is in Kentucky. Okay. We had a distiller for a while and we're switching. Our next distillation will be a new distiller. Um, the first one, we signed a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't state who that was, mm -hmm. um, but some, you know, very reputable, everyone knows sure. the distiller. Yeah. And then, so our next distiller is Bluegrass Distilling, and they are building a new facility in Midway, Kentucky, outside of Lexington. They are okay with us talking about that. I think that's a good, a good way to be transparent and educate our customers about where the product's actually coming from. Okay. Well, that's great. And then I, I just, I see right now you have on your website, like you've got a straight rye whiskey that's available. It's called the prelude. Mm -hmm. And then I know you've got a, like a bunch more planned for release, you know, fairly soon over the next couple of years. So do you want to maybe walk us through that? So our first product was released in mid-October of 2023. It's called the Prelude. Uh -huh. We we did that because it is in the stock bottle and because it's still a young product. It's aged 32 months. Okay. Um, definitely was ready for, for bottling. It's a delicious product. It tastes more mature than, than stated age. Um, and we did that as a, a way of like, again, a nod to theater. So this is the Prelude. This is like prior mm -hmm. to our release of our products in our custom bottle. And then our next release is called, will be called the Overture. And it will also be in the stock bottle. Looks It'll look similar, but slightly different from the Prelude. And it's from that same distillation batch of rye. So it'll just be another, it'll be like three years and three months um, aged by the time we dump it for blending and bottling. And well, that will probably go, the Prelude was a 10 barrel blend. This will be closer to a 30 barrel blend. We're not, we're not totally narrowed down to exactly what the blend is, but that's, that's the range we're looking in. We're still working through with our blender for the final decision on the blend. Um, so that will be released in late April of 2024. Mm -hmm. And then we have our, four-year bourbon which will be be released in early 2025 that distillation batch turns four right at the new year so once we have a blend available and then get get the time to blend bottle get the labels on um, and get distributed up here then we'll release a, a four-year bourbon and then about eight months later We'll hit four years on a weeded bourbon mash bill as well. Haven't even tried that one yet because they are the finickiest as far as like aging. And so once we get sampling that, we'll have an idea, but it'll be at least four years before that's released. Okay, great. Well, thank you for walking us through the whole profile there. So a lot of exciting stuff kind of feel like always on tap in the future there for you. And to take it another step, we are emptying these 30 barrels in April. And uh, this is this is a new thing for our business. We are sending those barrels down to Tequila, Mexico, and we're working with the distillery there. We're contract distilling tequila to refill those barrels. So uh, in the fairly near future, we will also have a tequila product. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, it seems like tequila in recent years has kind of gained a popularity or a foothold similar to 
kind of bourbon. I'm here in Los Angeles and I can I can speak to <laughs> bourbon just uh, it's been popular here out here. I I can recall maybe in the late like 2008 2009 people started to shift from vodka soda to bourbon and it just it's never really died off since then. So and it seems like tequila is kind of has that similar type of momentum behind it. It does seem like it's getting gaining some momentum, yes. Well, great. And then, so Julie, can you tell us um, as a startup brand what it's like for you to kind of build up your sales or, you know, connect with would-be customers? Can you kind of walk us through your, your experiences, maybe day-to-day and what you're going through? Yes. From the beginning, we were going, taking single barrel samples to bars, restaurants, liquor stores, talking to, you know, the person that's the buyer for the store or for the uh, bar and having them sample our product, telling the story, just telling them why our product is better, which is, you know, it's because quality is our our North North Star and that we have the best barrels in the world that we're, all of our product is aged in. And then, so that's just starting, we're just trying to create, um, awareness of the brand and you know our distributor once we had a distributor signed here in indiana you know they even said to us we're getting people asking for your product when we haven't even told them about it yet so we had created enough of an awareness that there were people that were looking forward to the release of our product before they had even tasted our final blend and then we didn't stop there i didn't want to just sit back and let our distributor sell our product because no one sells it better than than yourself so i've been going to i've been continuing to go places and um have them try our product i've been going to a a lot of liquor stores and doing samplings so that people can taste the product and know that it's worth purchasing you know it's a young product it's a name nobody knows about it's a local brand and that can either be a good thing or a bad thing and you're not Mm going to know until you try it so I'm trying to get samples in people's hands they can you know talk to me um I try to get to the in a conversation some people don't want to really engage and others that do they find out I'm the owner and then they're just like you know some people just want to be supportive because you're there and you're um you know really telling them the story and they they resonate with that so i'm continuing to do that um i i'm traveling to a different i've done that mostly in the indianapolis area up to this Mm -hmm. point but like next week i'm going to evansville indiana which they have been selling our product fairly vigorously so i'm going with the salesperson down there to spend the day to you know talk to people and do some samplings and continue to get our name out yeah i'll continue to do that so it's a lot of just kind of doing it the old fashioned way, you know, handshake, story, tell, sample the product. It's got to be, it's got to be fun on some level, right? It's really, actually really enjoy it. Um, I just, I like to see different, everyone's reaction to it. Hmm. I also just like to do the people watching of like, um, you know, each liquor store has its own personality and, and there's a, you know, some are heavy in, you know, whiskey sales and some are heavy in beer sales and, you know, I I just enjoy the entire experience of it, but I I really enjoy talking to people and getting them interested in the product and just knowing, you know, there's one more person that's, you know, going to know who we are and know that they, you know, met the owner and know that we're serious about it because I'm out there. Mm-hmm. Well, great. And can you speak to, or, um, you know, tell us uh, about like any sort of partnerships or collaborations that you've formed um, since the beginning that may have that may be helping you also grow the brand or the business? I think the biggest partnership is with our Cooperage. Sega Moreau uh, Cooperage is in Napa, California. And we found them by when we were doing research and interviewing a lot of other distillers. Most of them were in Kentucky, some in Indiana. And we asked everyone that we could think, you know, everyone we talked to, if you could use any cooperage, who would you use and why? And it became clear to us that Sega Moreau had something special. And that's what we were looking for was something 
special. They make very high-end barrels, and um, they originally started in cognac and wine. They're in Napa, California. They started in cognac, France. They've been making bourbon barrels for 17, 18 years. You know, mm. they're they're not wine barrels. They are bourbon barrels. They're American oak, 53-gallon barrels. But the way they uh, differentiate themselves from other cooperages that make bourbon barrels begins from standing in the forest and deciding which tree is being cut down. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to their mill in Arkansas in December, and I saw it for myself, their commitment to quality. And that makes a huge difference in the product on the other side of the the aging Mm -hmm. uh, process. And for us, it was, it's an investment. It's definitely a lot more money to spend, you know, big Cooper or big um, distilleries that put out tons and tons of product. Not only would they not have that type of barrel available in any kind of volume that they would need, but it's also just cost prohibitive. Um, But for us, it's the investment in the quality of the product that we're getting out at the end. It's, it's quite apparent and, you know, we're glad we did it. And we like to talk about Segamoro. Mm. We're really proud of them. We're really proud of their barrels and our decision to use them and um, just really looking forward to the next products coming out because the prelude is fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Well, you've been listening to the Sipping Success uh, podcast, and on this episode, we've been talking with Julie Schmaltz, and she is the founder or CEO of Fortune's Fool, and uh, it is a whiskey founded in Indiana, and it's been a wonderful kind of understanding the story and uh, your process and where you're at with everything. And um, if anyone wants to to check it out, uh, you can go to fortunespool.com right now, and uh, you can check out the prelude that is available. Uh, and then she highlights more products to come, particularly a four-year rye whiskey, a four-year bourbon whiskey, and a four-year weeded bourbon whiskey, all slated over the next year or so to come out. And um, we are getting down to our last couple questions here. And so... Julie, I'd like to, you know, ask you about, you know, given you all your experiences now since 2017, you know, what advice would you give maybe somebody younger looking to develop their own spirits brand? I think it's really important to, for two things. I think it's important to have a story because you have to find, a, you've got to find your way into the the minds and the hearts of your customers. And you also have have to have a way to differentiate yourself and that could be your story but uh for us it's it's the barrels and um those are those are the two two things we talk about the most uh the story of a physician leaving medicine to to create a whiskey product is seeming to be very resonant with a lot of people a lot of people relate to especially around my age of 50 changing careers and several people have told me oh my gosh you're living my my dream so like to have a story that people are like wow that's you know that's really cool and you know it's such a crowded field so to have something for us like our barrels and sticking to that is is a way to kind of to stand out and and have a good foundation to build a a great brand well that's great thanks for for sharing all that and then if anybody wants to connect with you. So that would be like, you know, our audience is very entrepreneurial within the spirits, uh, food and beverage industry. So if anybody would want to connect with you and maybe ask a question or, you know, frankly, if anybody wants to just interact further with the brand, I know we mentioned the website earlier, we can mention again, but can you maybe list out the best ways for, for people to A, be in touch with you with any sort of question they might have, and then B, you know, where can they also interact with your brand online? Okay. So to contact me, uh, my email is Juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T at fortunesfool.com. Mm-hmm. I'm also on LinkedIn as Juliet Schmaltz. Instagram, I'm also at Juliet Schmaltz. <laughs> you know, no underscores or anything, just straight mm-hmm. uh, first and last name. And then on Instagram, we also, Fortunesful Whiskey is on Instagram as at Fortunesful Whiskey. 
Okay. Fortunesfool.com is our website. That's right. Uh, Fortunesfool.com is the website. And um, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been uh, really interesting hearing your story and uh, again, the growth and, and where you're at and where you're headed. So don't be a stranger. And um, we, we've really uh, liked connecting with you here on the episode. Uh, so thanks again, Juliet. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, uh, that is another episode of the Sipping Success podcast. I'm your host, Casey Hawkinson. Thank you all for tuning in. And until next time. And that's a wrap on another insightful episode of Sipping Success brought to you by Mushroom Media. We hope our discussions have left you thirsting for more knowledge in the world of beverages and alcohol. Stay connected with us on social media for updates. And remember, the journey to success is best enjoyed one sip at a time. Keep exploring trends, connecting with leaders, and scaling your brand. Until our glasses meet again, cheers to your continued success. And may your cups always runneth over with inspiration. We'll catch you in the next episode.